Happy Resurrection Day. I'm so glad you could join us on our online platform. I hope you have a great Easter today. Looking forward to just spending a few minutes walking through the Easter story, considering what it means in particular, how the resurrection is um, applicable to us today. So let's pray and then we're going to jump in and we're going to be looking at the resurrection story from John's gospel. So if you'd like to turn there in John chapter 19 and then we'll go into John 20 as well. So Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Speak to us, we pray. We want to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it says in John chapter 19, beginning of verse 23, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. That's in Psalm 22, verse 18. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. After this, knowing that, his, that all was now finished, he said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And that's in Psalm 69, verse 21, which Jesus fulfilled. And saying this, a jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It was about 3 p.m. in the afternoon when Jesus died. But he was executed as a guilty criminal, a vile criminal, in fact. He was humiliated, he was tortured and murdered in the cruelest of ways. Why? Because he loves you, because he loves me, because he, he wants to spare us from the penalty of our sins. And to confirm his death, as you read on, Jesus was pierced in the heart with a spear. There was no mistaking. Jesus died. He had died. Now, can you imagine if the story ended there, if that was the end of the Gospels? They ended at 3 p.m. on Good Friday. We wouldn't be calling it Good Friday if this was the end of the story, if the great climax was nothing more than Jesus' death. There's a tribe in Africa that engages in a unique funeral custom. Friends and family, they circle the casket and they quietly gaze at the corpse. No singing, no flowers, no tears. A peppermint candy is passed out to everyone there, and at a signal, each one puts the candy in their mouth, and when the candy is gone, each participant is reminded that life for this person is over. They believe life simply dissolves, that there is no eternal life, and therefore no hope after they're gone, and no hope leading to death either. I mean, if, if this is the end of it all, well, what's the point? There is no hope. That's what it would be like if the Gospels ended with Jesus' death. But the Gospels don't end there, do they? They don't end with his death. They end with the resurrection. In fact, they end even a little later with the ascension. See, the resurrection is the evidence that undergirds our Christian faith. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. There is no power. But because it happened, because Jesus rose from the grave and because he ascended into heaven and because he lives, we now have hope in darkness. We have assurance of heaven. We have the promise and the availability of God's power, which is able to transform lives. Now, I'd like to consider a snippet of Jesus' life after he rose from the grave and see a woman's discovery of God's power, which filled her with hope. And we're picking up here in John chapter 20, in verse 1, where it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. 
It's the third day since Jesus' death, and John focuses on Mary Magdalene as one of the main characters in the resurrection story. Early in the morning, she awoke before dawn and she went to the tomb. When she got there, she saw the stone rolled away and she panicked. Why is it gone? Who could have done this? What does this mean? Where is Jesus? And so emotional and distressed, she no doubt looked for answers. Look at verse 2. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. That's John talking about himself. And she said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple, that is John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. For as yet they didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. Mary stayed and she stood weeping outside the tomb. Weeping, that word means to wail, to bemoan and cry out loud. She wasn't just shedding a tear, she was wailing. She was convulsing. She was crying so hard. Why was Mary so distraught over the loss of Jesus? I think there's a number of reasons. One, she arrived with spices to anoint Jesus' body for his burial, but he wasn't there. Two, she lost her rabbi, who was a dear friend. Three, she couldn't imagine who would have taken him away. Where is he gone? But I think perhaps the biggest reason Mary was so upset was, was because Jesus was the only one up to this point. He was the only one who ever loved her unconditionally, who accepted her when she was unacceptable to the world, who healed and transformed her life, and yet now he's dead and gone, and all hope is lost. It's important to realize a little of Mary's background. If you want further details on her life, you can read about her in Luke chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 16. But there we're told that she was severely demon-possessed with seven demons. Severely demon-possessed. And many believe that she was a prostitute from the city of Magdala, hence her name, Mary Magdalene from Magdala, Mary from Magdala. But imagine her life. The demons ruling her body would have thrown her around and, and tormented her constantly. She would have suffered from mental and emotional trauma, voices in her head, images in her mind, creatures lurking in the darkness. She was rejected by society and an outcast since people would have either been afraid of her or appalled by her. She exuded evil. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody that's that just seems demonic or perhaps even were possessed, but you sense it. The hair on the back of your skin, the back of your neck comes up, you know, and you, you it's, it's eerie, it's weird. She exuded evil. She was possessed. And very few would have been comfortable around her. And when she was in her right mind, she would have been lonely with no friends or family to call upon and afraid, wondering, when it will happen again, the next time she would be overtaken by demons. But when Jesus reached out to her and touched her and set her free and healed her for the first time, perhaps in her life or at least for a very long time, she felt loved, accepted. She had a friend, a deep, close friend. She wasn't alone anymore. No more torment. No more fear. 
And when she saw Jesus on the cross, she watched her best friend, her closest ally. She watched him die. Her hopes, dreams, her comfort, strength, the joy of being known and accepted, all of it came crashing down and all hope was lost. Now she comes to the tomb where they laid his body, hoping to see him one more time, but he's gone. And thus she wailed aloud, why? Lord, why did you have to die? Why are you not here? Where have you gone? What has happened to your body? She is weeping. She is hurting. She is crying out. And as she wept, verse 11, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Notice verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary, blinded by her tears, sobbing convulsively, she questioned the angels and then spoke to the gardener, not realizing it wasn't the gardener, but it actually was Jesus. And she said to him, sir, if you've taken him away, please tell me where he is. Please tell me so I can go and bring him back so that I can get him. All of the sudden, she hears a familiar voice, a voice she knew well. And that voice said to her one word that warmed her heart like no other, Mary. Now, in the King James Version, there's an exclamation point, Mary. Jesus, I believe, was overjoyed with excitement. He, he didn't just say, oh, Mary, Oh, Mary, what's wrong with you? Why are you crying? It was, Mary, it's me. I, I'm here. He was thrilled to see her, so excited. And, she, and he knew how, how overjoyed she would have been. And she turned and she said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher, teacher. It's, it's you, Jesus, it's really you. It's you, it's your life. She embraced him. She grabbed hold and she wouldn't let go. And can you blame her? Can you blame her? Understanding her life, what she came from, how he had saved and delivered her, what he had turned her into. Can you blame her for holding on so tight? She didn't want to lose him again. She wasn't about to let him go. Not a chance. And then Jesus said something to her that we read and we're like, wow, that sounds kind of harsh. Notice what he said in verse 17. He said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. It wasn't a harsh thing for him to say at all. It seems like maybe the timing wasn't quite right, but he was actually saying something quite spectacular. Mary, you can't hold on to me forever. You can't cling to me forever because I'm going to heaven. I'm going to my Father, who is your Father. I'm going to my God, who is your God. Therefore, you can't hold on to me. Why? Because I must continue my ministry from heaven. I'm going there to continue ministering to you. And I have to do this. It has to happen this way. That's the implication of what he's saying to her. Now, let's understand this a little better. Remember, the night Jesus was talking with his disciples in the upper room is the same night that he was betrayed. He told them in John chapter 16, verse 7, It is to your advantage that I go away. 
For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. He was talking about ascending to heaven. That's what his departure was. If I depart and go to heaven, then I'm going to send you the helper, the Holy Spirit, and he will be with you forever. In verse 13, he goes on to say in John 16, and he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. He will be with you forever. He will be your helper, your comforter, your guide, your teacher, and he's going to be there for you. See, if Jesus were to remain on earth in bodily form, then he'd be limited to the work that he could accomplish because he was in one body. But by ascending to the Father, he was able to continue from heaven to minister to us, but also free to send the Holy Spirit to cover the whole earth. And the Holy Spirit, being just like Jesus, who is God, because the Spirit is God, he continues the ministry of Jesus on a global scale through Jesus' body, which is the church. So the church has become the spiritual body of Christ that covers the, the globe, and the Holy Spirit is the power of Christ that's working through his body. That's why he said, it's to your advantage that I go away. If I go away, I'll send you the helper, the Holy Spirit. And he will minister to you, and he will guide you and teach you, and he'll be with you. While Jesus in heaven continues his ministry as our advocate and our high priest. Our advocate who defends us to the Father. Yes, Father, they have sinned, but look at my scars. You know that I died. I paid the price for their sins. They are innocent. In fact, I've imputed my righteousness to them, and they are righteous in your sight. He's our advocate in heaven and he's our high priest who lives to make intercession for us. Who mediates between us and the Father. Who ministers to us in special, intimate, unique ways. So Jesus continues his ministry from heaven while the Holy Spirit ministers on behalf of Christ throughout the earth. So he instructed her not to cling to me. And he wasn't saying, back off, woman, get away. That's not what was happening here. He was making a very important distinction. I am going to be going away, and it's a good thing, Mary. It is a good thing. And so prepare yourself for what's coming. The Holy Spirit will come. And go tell my brethren that I am ascending. So verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that, she had, and that he had said these things to her. Mary bore witness to the fact that Jesus had risen from the dead as she went and told the disciples what she had seen and heard. Not only did Mary bear witness, but countless others afterwards did as well. There were the other women who saw Jesus alive. There were the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. The apostles saw him not long after that, and he was seen by over 500 people, 500 eyewitnesses throughout the time that he remained on earth before he ascended into heaven. The point is, eyewitness testimony is powerfully convincing in a court of law. If you marched 500 people into a courtroom today, all testifying of the same thing, the judge and jury would be convinced. The resurrection is the power behind the gospel and the evidence validating the meaning of Christ's death. He died to conquer sin and death. He died to pay the price for our sins to set us free. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 14 to 17, If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. He goes on to say, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. 
what he's saying is that everything hinges on the resurrection. Without it, we have no Christian faith. We have no Christianity. We have no resurrected Christ. We have no resurrection hope. If the resurrection didn't happen, then Christianity is the biggest farce of all time. It's a waste of time. But it did happen. So Mary told the disciples that Jesus had risen. But interestingly, we read in Luke 24, 11, the disciples didn't believe her, not at first. Ah, you're making up stories. Come on, Mary, what are you talking about? They didn't believe her not until they saw for themselves. I think there are specific and strategic ways that Jesus reveals himself to people, enabling people to know him. Because we're all different, we all have different makeups, we all have different things swirling in our minds, and Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves, and he knows everyone better than they know themselves. And so he can minister to each person uniquely in a way that they can hear and receive and respond to. And so to Mary, Jesus simply addressed her by name, Mary. And hearing Jesus say your name was enough. Teacher, it's you. Yes. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Mary heard his voice, knew it was him. Said, yeah, I'm in. Yes, it's you. To the disciples on the road to Emmaus, It wasn't until he broke bread with them. After he walked through the Old Testament, explaining how the laws, the law and the prophets all pointed to him. But it wasn't until he broke bread with them that their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. Jesus spent time with them. The relationship had grown, had taken shape. He had ministered to them in in very um, sort of doctrinal theological, and yet intimate ways. And through all of that, they came to know and discover. To Thomas, the skeptic, it wasn't until he touched the wound on Jesus' side and saw the scars in his hand that he believed. He needed to see the evidence. And when he did, he believed. What about Peter, though? Well, Peter believed he had risen. The Lord had appeared to him. But he couldn't embrace him. Why? Because he had denied him. And he was so guilty and he was so ashamed that he had sinned in denying the Lord three times. It wasn't until Jesus met him and spoke to him words of comfort, words of love, words of grace. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Then... Peter embraced the Lord and he walked with him from then on out. Maybe you've longed to hear the voice of one who loves you unconditionally or desired the comfort of a meaningful relationship or maybe you've avoided Jesus because you've been skeptical and you've had unanswered questions or you felt unworthy to come to Christ because of something you did. Jesus is reaching out to you He is reaching out, and if you'll take his hand and embrace him, he'll comfort your heart. He'll meet your needs. He'll answer your questions. He'll heal your wounds. That's what the resurrection is all about. That's what he's offering you today. That's why he came. In John 10.10, he said, I have come. Let me tell you the reason why I came. I have come that you may have life and that you might have it to the full, that you might experience life more abundantly. That's why I came, to give us life, abundant, fulfilling life here and now, eternal life, rewarding life for forever. And the resurrection assures us of this hope and this promise. That's the value. That's the beauty. That's the wonder of the resurrection. So, would you join me as we bow our hearts before the Lord and surrender our lives into his hands and say, God, I'm yours. Take my life. Do with me as you will. I desire to walk with you. 
because I want to know you. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your love toward us. Jesus, thank you that you haven't left us orphaned and you continue to minister to us even to this present hour. We are so grateful that you're alive and Lord, we're excited that you're coming back. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to really draw near to you. Help us to lay aside every weight and sin that so easily entangles and ensnares us that we could run with endurance the race that you have set before us. Help us to do that, Lord. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fall afresh on us, that you would anoint us with your life, fill us with your power, overflow from us your living water, quench our thirst and satisfy our appetites. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you have questions about what we looked at or you're curious to know more about the church, just drop us a note. Send an email. Make a call. We are presently studying through Luke's Gospel, and we'd love to have you join us. God bless you, and we hope to see you soon.